Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you might be in the world, whatever time it is. Hello, welcome, and thank you for joining. I'm pleased to present this Autodesk University presentation on Maya and Bifrost for Layout, bringing more to your cinematic workflow. My name is Scott Ede, and I'm here representing Autodesk as a technical specialist in the Media and Entertainment Division. I started with Autodesk earlier this year, joining a fantastic team of technical specialists catering towards animation, film, visual effects, games, and anything media and entertainment related. My previous role was head of previs and layout at MPC Vancouver, a visual effects and animation studio that worked on many large format feature films. I started my career as a modeler, moved into lighting, rendering, and compositing, have experience in effects, rigging, and animation, but have focused most of my time in the field of layout. And I'm super excited to be able to present to you today. First off, I must present this safe harbor statement. As I work for Autodesk, I may make statements regarding planned or future development for products. And in no way should decisions of product be made based on any potential future work. So in this session, I'm aiming for you to gain a good understanding of Bifrost for Maya overall. Discover the benefits of where it can be used, learn how to capitalize on tool sets, and accelerate your workflows. As I mentioned, I've spent many years focusing on and working in the field of layout. So I tend to closely relate my experiences of large film production from this vantage point. But I often get asked, what is layout? And I often have a hard time simply putting it into a small enough context to explain the amount that actually goes into it. But I'll try with this to start. Layout from the Oxford Dictionary simply states the way in which parts of something are arranged or laid out. It's simple, uh, to the point I suppose, but maybe not specific enough to define what the process of layout in the media and entertainment world does. Now, I first entered into the animation field for classical animation. My intention was to go off and draw for feature film animation studios. Now, that completely changed over time. I redirected my focus. Uh, the Disney studio moved out of Vancouver, and I was introduced to 3D computer animation. And, but back in the 2D classical animation process, there is a layout process a stage in which the assets and design and story come together to produce an environment or stage in which our characters live, for example. Now it's likely handled and drawn by only one artist at a time, and it goes through various stages of development. And they are in some cases extremely elaborate and extremely time consuming to produce, but for the most part, they are these you know, wonderful designs, like the example here. And now that's a bit different for the 3D worlds being built now. These worlds are fully immersive and almost tangible with the inclusion of stereoscopic views and such. The concepts of story, design, and stage were all included in the 3D world, but there are a number of additional tasks and hurdles included into the mix. Layout from a film and animation standpoint is comprised of multiple stages and processes within. Think of it like the steps up to a final product. Layout would reside in the early stages of film production. Creating the environment and initial looks of shots and sequences in this early previous component. Now this stage does not always take into account the overall planning needed to achieve the final look, nor the most efficient way of getting there. Previous is usually a fast initial pass of the whole sequence, often offering up ideas and solutions to principal filming of live action. Moving into the more finalized visualizations in the post-vis or post-visualization component, where at this point, live action images have been delivered. We then have to consider the overall plan of how we are able to make what is required for the shots work. What assets are needed, what shots are needed reworking entirely. And the last stage of the process, we have the integration of all of that work fed into some form of pipeline for use in downstream departments. This process needs to be flexible. It's crucial that it's fast and it needs to happen 
nonetheless so that the foundation or building blocks of the production don't get missed out. Now take the layout components out of the equation and it becomes quite difficult to really say what would happen. Either downstream departments and disciplines take on this work, or you have a scenario that I tend to explain with reference to building a house or any structure for that matter. Without the way in which parts of something are arranged or laid out, is kind of like moving forward on a house in absence of a blueprint. It's the absence of a plan and the foundation to actually build upon. It's hard to really define exactly what would happen, but I'd imagine some chaos, maybe back and forth between trades to figure out how things will work. Potential delays in build. Now you're faced with the potential of having to rebuild or change the design for the owner's vision after the final work has already been completed. And now you're spending way more than any budget was accounting for. And I suppose in all this, you could lose any interest in someone working on this project. You could lose your talent, or maybe you lose the opportunity to build future houses. Now this is closely relating to what happens in animation and filmmaking. And the added hurdle and most prevalent difference above all of this is the world being built is primarily digitized. Theoretically, you can build the roof before the walls. And this evolution of story and the input into that project needs to be completely flexible and allow for changes throughout the production. Large teams are all inputting into this final product and these workflows uh, are completely overlapping. Throughout my time in the industry, I came across multiple hurdles in what we were able to achieve in the final products that we were attempting to create. Hurdles like workflows, limitations in the tools, and without a means to be able to work faster for larger, more amazing projects, artists were left with this struggle in their, in their output. On one hand, I can deliver a high quality product, but it takes me way more time. And the speed at which I'm able to work does not align with the budget that we have to complete this. And on the other hand, I can do the work really fast, but the quality suffers tremendously. And we get something that simply won't work, something that audiences just won't watch, and something that I'm not really interested in as an artist looking to broaden my ability and creativity. And that all compounds into a common theme for artists, disciplines working on productions, and entire studios for that matter. We have to move from project to project, trying to repeat what we've done before with added complexity and in an even shorter timeline. We need to do it as fast as we possibly can, and even faster, and unfortunately, we've got way less money. So we're continually trying to figure out how we do that. We also have to figure out how we do it with the cost of creativity on the line, the cost of keeping talent or being able to have that input of ideas to the full potential. How can we help make the productions we work on highly creative, a highly creative environment, highly productive, an efficient environment without letting the creative input fade. We obviously need to create a plan, but artists across disciplines need a flexible platform that can handle large amounts of data. And we need to be able to work fast and coordinated and have a means to offer up bigger, better, more creative content. Enter into this equation Bifrost, a procedural framework for artists, TDs, and developers to author tools and workflows that are fast, scalable, and portable. So tell me what is Bifrost and why would we really even care? Well, using the Bifrost visual programming environment in Maya, we can automate complex processes and generate assets without writing a single line of code. Essentially, it's a data flow graph with the data flowing left to right along connections between ports and nodes. Now, Bifrost is a tool to accelerate almost every aspect of 3D production with added ready-to-use effects right out of the box. Bifrost is not just another tool. This is the tool that can actually make tools. And to be honest, it does so much more. So we start by working in a single shareable visual programming graph with nodes that range from simple to very complex operations. And these operations are being reduced down to portable, reusable compounds to really achieve big results. 
A powerful component of Bifrost is its use of compounds, which refer to nodes that contain subgraphs of other nodes, or even other compounds. And the code for these operations can also be exposed and viewed. These can then be published and shared with others, altered, republished, or even stay referenced in scene. And so we can then rapidly prototype and create production-ready, reusable libraries of features, setups, tools, effects, and more. And Bifrost comes packaged with a large number of ready-to-use effects in the Bifrost browser. One can simply import the example graphs and play back immediately through the Maya viewport. An artist or TD can then use these compounds and make small alterations, as in the example of this torch. And then those alterations can then be, again, published or reused or implemented in the scene quite easily. So we can look at the Bifrost compounds and usable content as a collection of packs. Each pack is by no means completely isolated, as there is overlap in all the functioning compounds here. So we started with the core pack, which is complete in the code and the UI and core functions, including file I.O., diagnostic tools, and more. We then have the effects pack, uh, implemented and ready to use now in Bifrost. And then the world pack and scattering tools, which would cater to simpler workflows of large asset distribution through user-friendly compounds. And this is still a growing area of development, but a good amount of functionality is already there and available to create bigger, better environments, faster than we have done before. And I'll show you some of that shortly. All of this caters towards the function of building bigger worlds with definitive simulations for cinematic presentations. And the quality of the output is something that we can be using through to the final product, rather than approximations or mock-ups of, of what's required. So we start with the effects pack. Here, Maya artists and generalists can work with effects, elements, and make live, simple changes without involving effects to these. This example is showing the use of particles through Bifrost. You have the Bifrost Aero Solver, which allows you to create natural looking smoke, mist, and other gases. Bifrost Combustion Solvers solves both physics and chemistry by using real world fuels and their physical properties. And that includes things like soot formation and oxidization, radiative heating, and a condensation model. The NPM solver is included in the effects pack, or the material point method. And this is a technique used to simulate the behavior of multi-phase materials and other materials modeled as a continuous mass or body. Now, Autodesk teamed up with Jixi FX, founded by the members of the original NPM research team, to develop a production-ready NPM solver directly in Bifrost. NPM can handle complex geometries as suitable for large deformation problems. And NPM is also a physically based multi-solver, which allows for other materials to interact naturally together. You know, for instance, you have the sand, snow, and cloth colliding together with dynamic tearing in the upper left corner. So strands are also good to mention here. They're in a class of their own, not included in the effects pack necessarily. Uh, but they're good to note here as their use with NPM fibers becomes extremely powerful in applying dynamics to materials that consist of individual strands. It's a good candidate for hair and fur simulation. They can interact with each other or individually break apart. And if you haven't heard of strands before, the name comes from soft homage ice. They are basically geometry comprised of curves. And strands applications are seen in examples like the braided hair simulation here, or fuzz and fur applications. This is seen in Matt Chan's example, uh, which you can find online. Now here you have an example of using a volume scope diagnostic tool uh, in Bifrost, which visualizes the flow of volumes in these colorful strands. And that strand output can then be used in something like this presentation of, of chains, uh, instances of chains done by Jonah Friedman um, that are effectively you know, populated along these strands. 
And so we move into the world building and scattering pack. And although this is still an area of development, there are a lot of major components already available for things like set dressing, scene assembly, level building, and more. Layout, animation, and environment artists will be able to work procedurally with much larger numbers of instances. Additionally, if you haven't yet seen the Vision Series presentation, Lights, Cameras, Effects, Exploring What's Possible with Bifrost, it's available to watch online. And this is a, a really cool uh, video on building up a scene with trees and snow and applying that to a scenic uh, mountaintop. We can additionally leverage tools that will allow us to better create complex assets that would otherwise take a lot of time and or money to create. People have already started implementing basic L systems in Bifrost to create something like this simple vegetation. Now an L system, it's something that models growth processes of, of plant development. And L systems have also been used to model things like the morphology of organisms. Now we can leverage what is available in Bifrost to assist in not only creation, but also fixing geometry or creating simpler, lighter models. Bifrost can treat scan data or existing models that have multiple pieces needing merging together. And additionally, clean up that geo for issues that arise. Things like uh, non-manifold geometry or faces with holes or non-planar faces, uh, faces with zero area or edges with zero length. And then we go into the scattering and the ability to scatter and constrain assets to geo that may be deforming. Um, this example uses uh, an ocean simulation with ocean debris constrained to the surface. And we're leveraging Maya's rivet options, um, which is based on a UV pin, but also using Bifrost to kind of instance geometry in there. And this doesn't have to be an ocean. This could be a character uh, or anything really that you can, can think of uh, you want to populate assets onto. There are so many scenarios that you might need to build up your project, your scene, your shot. And Bifrost has so many features that complement that ability to produce content for your cinematic workflows. Tools, effects, world building. So let's take a look at some examples where I'm going to show you how you can implement Bi Bifrost into your workflow. Now, we won't be looking at effect simulations from Bifrost. Instead, we'll focus on world building and scattering functionalities. Let's take a look. In this first example, we'll start from the basics. I'm going to start by accessing the Bifrost graph editor. And if you haven't already downloaded Bifrost for Maya 2018, 2019, or 2020, you'll need to go ahead and do that. And once that is downloaded, I'll need to ensure the plugin is loaded in the plugin manager. And you'll see all the Bifrost plugin options, including Bifrost Ocean Simulator and some others. Now, once loaded, I'll have access to the Bifrost shelf. I'll open that and select the Bifrost graph editor icon. The second icon is the Bifrost browser. I can also access that in the graph editor prior to creating a graph. And this gives me access to all the available graphs that have been included with the Bifrost download. That I can import change to my own design, and save back out for others to use. So first off, let's create a graph. Immediately, I see in the Bif that the Bifrost graph has been created in my outliner, and I can create as many graphs as I like. And each time, you'll see those graphs populate the outliner. Rename them as you see fit to organize your graphs. But I'd like to start out by simply bringing in an asset into my Bifrost graph and into Maya to view. I have an Alembic file on hand that's fairly heavy in scene and is quite slow to load. This Alembic file is approximately 8.5 gigs and load times average around 40 seconds to a minute. So when using the default cache import, which is just taking too long, or trying it through the edit import, um, I seem to get the same results. It's just too time consuming for me to repeatedly do this in that way. So I'm going to do this through the to, through Bifrost to leverage the speed and continue to make some additional changes. Clicking tab, I gain access to the Bifrost graphs, compounds, and nodes under the folders. You can see here core tools, diagnostic tools, simulation tools. And here in the file, I have the read and write file types. But I can also simply type Alembic into the search field here and get the options that include Alembic in the name. 
And above here are the compounds uh, or graphs that I've used recently. So I want to select a read alembic compound. This will allow me to select a mesh to bring in. And I need to access the parameter editor. That will give me access to the file I want to load. Additionally, I can input a directory, change the frame of the cache or frame rate. And there are some additional parameters here. If you're unsure of what something does, you can access the information panel and get details and descriptions of what the parameters may affect or do. So I'll select the folder icon and find the Alembic file that I'm needing to open. But I don't get anything in Maya right away. I need to plug this into the output to get something viewable in Maya. And when I do that, immediately I get the Alembic file loaded in, in a fraction of a second. It's remarkably fast. You also see when I plugged, into, uh, plugged it in that the Bifrost node was created in the outliner. This is directly related to this output and I can select my object this way. Now I also have animation with this Alembic file but it's not playing back here when I scrub the timeline. So I need to expand the read Alembic properties and access the frame port where I will force the frame based on time. Now I could search for that with the tab function or simply right click and go down to the create node and I'll be offered up some possible input options for that port. I select that and I get the time plugged into the frame port automatically. And now when I scrub through the time, I can see the building destruction throughout the timeline. And the speed of that playback is fast. It's much faster than the playback I was getting through Maya's DG directly. So now I'd like to duplicate this asset many times over in my scene. And I'll need a platform to distribute on. Uh, let's use a ground plane. So I'll create a simple polygon mesh, scale that up to a scale where the building can be distributed on. And then I'll have to bring that plane into my Bifrost graph by selecting it in the outliner, middle click, and drag it directly in. And I want to instance this building many times over. So let's tab into the search field again and type instance. And I want to set instance geometry compound. And I'll take that Alembic mesh output and plug it into the instance geometry port. And the ground plane that I want to distribute, I'll plug that into the points port, which will place the building at each point the plane has with, which is each vertex. Oh, I need to plug that into a different port of the output. And here you see very quickly the distribution of this Alembic file, distributed on each vertex. And still I'm able to go down into the, the timeline and scrub. And I'm able to actually kind of move around quite fast. There's no noticeable lag that I can tell from before with only you know the one Alembic file previous. So now I have a 10 by 10 grid. So that's 11 by 11 ver vertices. Uh, that's 121 points uh, of distribution. And this building is made up of about 800,000 polys. It's 20,000 objects. So my results here is pretty much displaying approximately 2.4 million objects. And I'm able to scrub through the timeline and navigate in the scene quite effortlessly. This is really cool. So now moving on, I can mix up the sizes of each of these caches quite easily. I'll tab in again and type scale into the search field and I'm looking for this set random point scale compound. And I'll input my instances and re-output this. And here you'll see I get some randomized scales across the plane. Now when I look at the parameters, I can input and change uh, the min and max scales of these buildings. And I can also go up and access the curve editor at the top and affect the distribution of scale across my instances from minimum to maximum. And the curve right now displays a finite amount of large buildings being distributed. And I can increase that amount by simply ramping up the curve uh, in the top range of my graph. So we'll just leave that down at the bottom for now to get a happy mix. Now each building is still looking a little similar in rotations. Uh, you may want something like this for a city scene, but for me, I want to randomize the rotation. So let's tab in and search for randomize, aim and up. And I'll plug that in the same way. So I'm randomizing the rotation values in Y here. And I can affect that even more by changing those values in all three axes. And you can see here, this may not look 
too good for this application, but it's good to know there that uh, that's available to, to do if you're dispersing some other type of asset. And I can change the seed for uh, the distribution, get a different randomized population. So another problem noted here is that we might not want the buildings to simply be distributed based on the very grid-like formation of this polygon plane. We could uh, very well move and manipulate the points one by one, or we could we can look for a scatter points compound. Plug my plane into that, and then into the points port of the set instance geometry, and this will allow for random scattering of points on the surface. And I can go ahead and change the amount even still in the scatter points parameters, reduce down the number, or I can really bump that number up and get a huge number of them. Now this doesn't look as good because now my buildings are colliding quite badly, but I still have the ability to scrub through the timeline and navigate the scene quite easily. Now we can start scouting large scenes like this, or I'd assume li likely much larger than what we see here. And, you know, I'd like to just also have just a quick look through all of this through my Arnold render. I want something looking a little bit prettier, let's say. I want some lights and shadows. Let's see what the scene looks like with all of that turned on. So I can go into Arnold and simply turn on the Arnold render view. And wait for that to turn on. And I'll just pause this quickly and create a sky dome. I don't have lights in here yet. And, and then once I've done that, I can restart the render. And with rendering on GPU, I'm rendering all of this quite quickly. It, it's pretty cool. And this is all very beneficial for setting up scenes quickly, moving around in large environments, and even showing what would be needed for visual presentation without a large cost in time, play blasting or rendering. So let's move on and take a look at our next example. Let's now look at ways in which Bifrost tools and Maya tools combined can work together to allow for you to build up even more in this cinematic world. So in that previous example, we simply scattered across the surface and allowed for my asset to be placed by either random scatter or by the object's points. And in this example, I wanna get a little bit more artistic with my approach. I want to leverage Bifrost tools and combine them with what's available in the Maya tools. And what I'm starting out here uh, with here is a, a piece of geometry, let's say a mountain range or smaller foothills. And I've added a simple Arnold sky dome with a sky map to get a look of, kind of outdoors. I've got my sky and my ground. And I want to populate this landscape with some trees. And I want to be able to, let's say, paint these on. Rather than a scattered approach and hope that the placement works, I want to be a little bit more specific with where I'm placing things. Now, going in and placing things one by one would just not work for me. You know, and how many trees I want, it would just take too much time. So what I'll do is I'll use Bifrost to house the instances that I'm going to distribute. Now, the assets that I'm going to use here can be seen in this other scene that I have open. Now I have these three trees to use, each one different, but each one a little heavy to use in extremely large numbers. Uh, and that might slow me down. So instead, I'm gonna use these low poly representations of the trees instead, something that captures the basic shape of those trees. I'm gonna use this prism, this cube, and this pyramid to replace and resemble what would be the final look in my scene. And I could show you how we can do that. So back within Maya, and we open up the Bifrost graph editor, I already have my graph built up for what I'm needing here. And it may look a, a bit more complex than the previous graph we created, but it's actually quite simple. It's, it's very similar to what we had built before with the building. Here I have my set instance geometry compound, where I would input the objects and points, and I've got my scatter points compound, and plugged into that is my ground geometry. I have the randomized rotations, or randomized aim and up, and the set random point scale. And the difference here is what I'm plugging into my set instance geometry compound. I've got that 
pyramid plugged in uh, that I showed you. And I'm using a render archive of the high detail tree that's plugged into the instance geometry ports. And my pyramid is plugged into the preview geometries port here. And the render archive itself is pointing to an arnold.as file. So I'll back out and down and you can see what I've done the same that I've done the same thing below here. I've got my cube shape and the tree 2 represented here as my instance. And then finally the third down at the bottom is the prism shape and the tree 3. So effectively I can maximize the graph here and select a region and for organizational purposes I can create a backdrop to highlight the processes in my graph. Overall this is three separate setups like this all plugged into the same output using the same terrain here. So cool let's go back into the scatter points compound and there's a feature within it that's going to help me out here. Down at the very bottom here, I have a mask category and an enable mask feature, which I've selected. And below that mask property, which I've added in here, tree one into this field. Now I've done the same for the second setup. This one's simply called tree two. And you may have guessed it on the third, tree three. Now these names each reflect a Maya color set that I've established for my ground geometry. You can see here tree one, tree two, and tree three. And this will benefit me here. I can now use these color sets to basically paint trees onto the surface of my ground. So I'll need the color set editor and I'll need to open the paint vertex color tool. And I can paint these trees on now by selecting these tree types. And I can call these whatever. Uh, they may be pine or palm or some other kind of asset entirely. I can use all the features here in the paint vertex color tool. I can replace, remove, add, change the size of my paintbrush. I'll have to change the color to white here as my base starts out completely flooded black. And then I can choose the tree that I want to distribute. And I just start painting on the surface where I want those trees to live. And you can see I have control over where they go and I can switch up the type of tree. You can have a whole library of assets here to choose from. It's, it's totally flexible setup. And I can go back to the paint tools and remove trees by simply painting black um, over the, the color value here. I can also simply flood the ground with black and re remove the work if I'm not happy with it. Let's say repaint that tree type into another area. It's extremely simple to work up a scene with these tree types where, where I want them. And I can go back and make live changes that I would uh, want to in the Bifrost graph. Going in and let's say changing the rotation values here, maybe adding some tilt in, in other axes if you, you feel so, uh, feel like you want to. And I can go into the scale and affect the distribution again by affecting the, the curve. And I can alter, let's say, the min and max values. Say I want some huge trees in here in the max scale range. Actually, let's make that a little smaller and reduce the minimum size also. So this makes the process very nonlinear and very a very procedural process. I can go back into the scatter points compound and play with the amount of trees laid out. So additionally, I have another cool feature here that I can leverage over and above that as well. And I can find that in the paint vertex color tool itself. I can go into the attribute maps down at the bottom in a little subfolder called import. And I can actually import a map of where I want my trees to reside on my surface. Maybe it's based on a hydrology map or a map denoting elevation or even a, a graded slope a map we're showing, you know, where steep um, angles wouldn't would allow less trees. So let's import a map here and I've got some pretty simple maps that could work. 
So go ahead and, and input that and have my trees follow that mapping on my ground. And so I can quickly go back into the graph, let's say, and I have too few trees here. So I can go back in and add some more back into that. And I can also keep adding more with the paint, the paintbrush over and above. I'm not stuck with this, just this map imported. Or let's remove some again, and maybe I just don't need that much in this, in this one area. So I can continue to simply import these maps into the different color sets or those different trees that I that I want. And the last one here. And there you go. I've got a good distribution of trees based on some maps for my for my foothills. And I can add a couple more in here if I want. I'll just play around with it. And here comes a really cool part. I'm done with the layout and now I want to see what this will look like rendered out. So let's open up Arnold and see those render archive instances that are going to be placed where our prism, cube, and pyramid are. Let's, let's check out the detail. So again, opening up Arnold. And there. And refresh this. Oop, press play. Cool. So you can see here the render archives or the .as files of each tree in my scene and, and you can see it, it's giving you the detail with, with all the light, shadows, textures. And what's actually really cool is it's quite fast. Again, I'm leveraging the, the GPU for this render and I can move around in my scene and look for interesting spots to kind of start my shot out. The rend render output is fast here. And it's giving me like this, this quality that I'd be able to go through and, and potentially check for you know, maybe issues or errors with uh, finite details in, in the tree and quickly see areas that I might be interested in. And honestly, I could play with this all day, but we do have to move on. And I, and I wanna show you one last thing with the graph. And in this case, I wanna change what might be distributed out on that ground. So I wanna swap what I have uh, currently in the, the cube, the prism and the pyramid out for something else. And I don't have to keep this preview geometry at all um, that I've distributed. Let's say that they're just not working for me. I've been given some other trees uh, and I have them in my scene here with a little bit more detail. And so I want to use some of those to put into my scene rather than this simple geometry. As I said, I'm not stuck with this. So I'll bring the tree into the graph and replace the pyramid for this distribution of trees. And immediately you can see these trees don't really match actually the, the render archive trees as close, but the concept is that you can swap these out at any time. You can see it's amazingly fast. It's going to reuse what I just painted down. I don't have to go and start from scratch. And I can go through and do this with each. None of this is throwaway work. I don't have to completely um, redo this stuff at all. So let's say an artist is needing you know, a higher level of display to closely interact with set pieces or, you know, animate in and, around, in and around objects that uh, and make sure that they're not colliding with. It's super quick. And one can do this in scene by simply just replacing these things. And then I can get a, a, a closer look and get more information from this high level display. So I hope that sparked some interest and showed you how you can leverage Maya and Bifrost tools combined together to get more of an artistic approach for your layout. So let's take a look at one last set of examples of how Bifrost can, can be used as a tool that is readily available within its current functionality to surely accelerate building bigger, better scenes. This third and final example is really quite cool. So Bifrost has a unique ability to take something very simple and create a large volume of information out of it with a few simple tools. In this example, we have a simple plane which is being used to generate a distance and position from one plane to the other. Based on the number of points we have up here in the, in the upper plane, we generate the points down here in the lower plane. 
And if we take a look at the graph, it's very straightforward. This is the lower plane, and we've, we've got ground and the upper plane, and we're pulling some point positions and getting closest locations based on the distance, and sampling those positions, and then constructing the points again. And then we set the points in shape, and additionally the point size. So anything that we do to this plane is going to be reflected in the points that are generated on the ground. So we can increase the number of points that we, we have in the upper plane, and we can create modeling operations so that we what we do to these points is going to continue to look uh, at the distance and the position on the ground. And from here we can start making modeling changes. You know, I can create a more complex shape. Uh, I can select the edges and extrude them out and then increase the number of divisions uh, in, in those extrusions. And the points are going to update for us. So this is, this is really interesting. We have something that looks very much like an, an intersection. We could effectively repopulate this with uh, cars or people or street lights, or pretty much anything you can think of needing. And this could be a good city grid or park layout. And we're very, still very much paying attention to the positions of all the points. If I start, you know, let's say I use the soft select tool and start to move or manipulate the points uh, upward or downward, you can see these points update as I move the points further and closer to the surface. And I could make changes to this shape and over time to produce something along the lines of, you know, maybe motion graphics or something. And over the course, we can rotate this around and we're getting the resulting points that we would expect to see in the lower grid. So I can really, you know, I really like how this, this simple uh, example kind of, you know, we can make something more out of it. Let's look at a, at a bigger, broader uh, example. And this is really kind of cool because it takes the previous example and expands upon it with the addition of some new rules in order to have more of a granular control. So like just like before, we're, we're using a plane to direct our points and look at the distance from one surface to the other. Now, in this case, we've exposed some controls uh, out of the Bifrost graph and made them available here for artists to control. And we can control the number of points generated and furthermore, the distance. And we have uh, lights on here with shadows to assist in this example. And we're using something here called ray cast sampling method, which effectively casts rays from our upper surface down onto our lower ground, just as the light would cast rays on an object. And any rays that miss or are out of range as far as distance will not be generated. Generated, And we can see the actual data that is generated here when we unhide our Bifrost output of those rays. And you can see them here being shot down onto the surface. And as we get closer to the surface, the rules apply like this last example. The closer to the surface, the more points. And the raycast method here gives us the ability to change the direction. We can rotate this around and you can see the backside of the ground and the part that is uh, in shadow. It doesn't draw any points and there aren't any trees here. So points only get generated where the requirements of the graph are, are met. So we can hide the rays here. And once we get a location, uh, the, the trees we want, we can change those values here in our channel box that directly affect our graph. So we can increase the distance. So now the trees populate further onto the ground. And if we want to increase the amount of trees here, we can increase the value. Uh, as mentioned before, Bifrost is very robust in its capability for generating large volumes of information. So it's pretty easy to simply apply a large amount of trees onto this surface. And again, we, we still meet those requirements of the graph and the rays being cast. And this could work for something like actual analysis of mountain geometry, where we look at distribution of vegetation only for certain areas of increased light or opposing shadowed areas, um, where a, a differing shade, a specific plant may be present. Maybe even some areas of erosion due to steep angles and such. So in this last example in here is, is similar to our previous examples, where we cast some rays onto a plane, onto our ground. But a step further here is that we're also taking into account the normals of the surface underneath. Additionally, we have exposed some other controls that allow us to vary what we have distributed onto the surface. 
So we have been only dealing with one type of tree prior. We can allow for the addition of other trees into this mix and what we have distributed. Based on the ID of those points, we can intersperse those variations of the tree into the mix. And this can be really as many types of trees that you want. The, the last thing we can do here, uh, maybe we have some sort of brand identity or specific shape that we need to distribute here. Maybe it's a, a logo or something. And we can use something like this uh, fabulous AU logo to cast the positions of distribution. And this is just another really cool way of adding flexibility into your workflow. Of course, we're, we're, we're not tied to our, our type node here. So we can change the text and uh, we'll see the update on the, on the surface. We can change the, the font and whatever you see fit to do here, you can, you can kind of alter. So those are some of the ways we can scatter using rays to achieve a look based on our layout rules and tools that we've created in Bifrost and leverage in Maya. So as you can see, there are so many ways that Bifrost can assist in this creative process and really help to expedite workflows. Bifrost and the procedural nature of the visual programming graph open up opportunities of collaboration between artists, TDs, and programmers alike. And the community and the resource is growing. The tutorials and work being created by individual users is building. You can upload and download your own compounds that you want to share or others can share with you. The online forum for Bifrost is specific to Bifrost and Bifrost issues. You can download the Rebel Pack uh, in addition to what comes with Bifrost. And the Rebel Pack includes added helpful compounds and tools that are released from the Bifrost developers. There are specific Bifrost introduction pages and detailed information if needing help getting started. If I were to recommend an article to take away that sheds some light on the beginnings and progression into what Bifrost is today, I would check out a Bifrost journey. It was released in November of last year, but it's a very interesting read. If you haven't read it, it includes some insightful info on Bifrost's intended design of being a tool to make artists even more capable and amazing. And lastly, you got to know that Bifrost is completely free. With Maya, you can run Bifrost on up to four computers uh, at the same time, one on the DCC and three running a Bifrost command if you want. And if you have a collection subscription, you're entitled to run Bifrost command on up to 15 computers at the same time. So this is all just adding to that value of why we would use Bifrost. So I'd like to thank you for your time today. I had fun putting this all together for you, and I'm excited for you to be able to take away some of this knowledge and put it to use uh, in your own workflows. Start playing with Bifrost, and you'll you'll be pleasantly surprised, I think, and, 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 and just to know how awesome a tool this can be. Thank you very much.